we're, we're doing great for tech today. On the plus side, everybody should be in the room by now. Uh, so super excited for what we're doing. Lots of lessons learned that we're gonna, we're gonna get today. Let's go do the uh, next two slides that we must show you, and then I'll do a quick bio. Uh, so there you go. We must show you the course description and the learning objectives. Um, so for bios, let me see, that's over here. I've got Melissa Wilfong, principal at Grim Parker. Uh, 24 years in so far has supported many clients through developing new standards and modern educational methodologies. Um, many lead and net zero firsts. And uh, Melissa has worked with city schools from the inception of the 21st century schools plan. Pretty neat. Uh, Robin Toth, uh, owner and principal of TCA Architects, uh, past 25 years to sustainable design and education facilities and has worked over on over 88 school projects in the state of Maryland. Um, notably was the uh, principal designer for Wild Lake Middle School, the first net zero school in Baltimore. And uh, the largest building in the nation that is able to function on an EUI of 13.8, which they will define later and tell you why that is so amazing. Um, and since then has been working on other similar projects that may not get to net zero, but are incorporating uh, sustainable and, and energy saving strategies. And Amy Upton, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, architect at Grim Par Grimma Parker Architects, um, has worked 20 years on K-12 schools, uh, recreation centers and libraries, is a firm principal and was the co Hold on, can I do this right? Co-project manager for uh, Hollibird and Graceland uh, in Baltimore to uh, the, the second and third net zero school in the state. Uh, and then also joining us um, is Laura Smiles, the uh, co-chair of CAE. So there you go. Uh, we have a poll we're gonna pick up while they do quick facts. Uh, and I think Kathleen can start that and it's, it's for who's in the audience, and we know a little bit how to how to target that. And thank you. All right, I think we are unmuted again. Kathleen just got kicked off. I'm really sorry, everybody. We're having tech issues today. Did you hear most of my intro or did I get muted when Kathleen dropped off? Anyone? We heard mostly everything, Ben. We just okay. got stopped at the quick facts and introducing the poll. Perfect. Yep. That was what I was looking for. So Kevin, are you able to start the poll or are we just gonna need to wait for Kathleen to get back? Yeah, I think I can launch the poll. Is it just the first question? It is, yeah. There you go. It's launched. Um, and if you're more than one, pick the one you mostly are. And then, Kevin, you have to hit the publish results. All righty. And that should oh. pop up for everybody. There you go. That is what we thought. So we will tailor towards architects today. Great. I will mute and, and uh, take it away.
Good morning, everybody. Um, the first thing we want to start on with was what is the definition of a net zero energy building? Per National Renewable Energy Laboratory, the technical definition is a building with greatly reduced energy needs through efficiency gains, such as the balance of the energy needs can be supplied with renewable technologies. But simply said, in a year's time, the amount of energy produced must be greater than the amount of energy used. Next. This slide is a graphic depiction of what I just explained. The bars in red represent the energy produced. The length of the bars increase in the summer months when the sun is out longer during the day and decreases during the winter months when the days are shorter. The energy consumed is represented by the blue bars. And as you can see, the length of the bars are longest in January when the heat on, is on and shortest in the summer when the school is not in session. So the goal is to have the green bars, which is the net energy, um, be equal if you add up those below the zero axis and those on the right that are above the zero axis. And at the end of the year, you will have produced more energy than you have used. <laughs> Next. A fun fact um, is that any building can become net zero energy as long as you have enough space and money to put panels that will equal the energy that is consumed by the building. Next, to make your net zero energy goal easier to achieve, you want to really reduce your energy consumption, which will mean you'll reduce the money spent on your renewable energies and therefore the amount of space needed to house your renewable energy system. Next, how do you reduce your energy consumption? It's important to understand the building's energy use index, which is commonly referred to as the building's EUI. To calculate your EUI, you need to know the amount of energy or KBTUs required to run the entire building throughout the year and you're thinking of all of your systems, your mechanical loads, your electrical loads, plug loads um, throughout. And then you divide the KBTU by the gross square footage of the building and the resulting quotient is your EUI. To ensure your building meets your energy goals, an energy model must be created during design so that you can design towards the EUI goal that you have. Next. As you can see on the chart, the trend in modern high performance building is to reduce your energy use index. At the top is an old conventional building. Um, this is when we were working on Wild Lake in about 2013 and looking at the existing school we were replacing and it was running at about a 66 to 73. Some systems have buildings that are running over the hundreds. For Wild Lake, we that project was based on an existing prototype building that had already received a LEED Silver certification in 2014, and it was expected to run around a 38. Um, as we will talk a little bit today, Wild Lake Middle School received a grant from the Maryland Energy Administration, the MEA, and they had a requirement that the building was gonna have to be run at less than a 25 EUI. We're proud to say that Wild Lake Middle School, as it's been operating in January, it'll be for five years now, is running as low as a 13.7 um, and has gone, I think, as high as 17 at certain points, but it is averaging between 13 and 7 um, over these five years. Um, once the owner saw the benefits of Wild Lake, their next project was not designed to be net zero, but we were able to use many, many energy efficiency strat strategies, um, which became stand standard and were implement implemented as the budget would allow. And as you can see, their next elementary school is functioning at a 28 without the MEA grant. Next. Each project is unique, as you will see throughout our presentation today. Um, so the cost implications of making it net zero may vary, but as you can see in this chart, though our projects are different in many ways, each of us were able to achieve net zero. 
We had different owners in different jurisdictions with different codes at different times, different versions of codes. Um, we had different delivery methods. We had a construction manager representing the owner on site every day, um, whereas the other two projects um, were designed or, excuse me, constructed by a general contractor. But each of them were able to be designed to the MEA's um, goals and should be net zero soon. Next. I'm gonna hand it over to Melissa to talk about the design process. Okay, thanks Robin. Um, I, we, we're, we're mostly architects here. Um, obviously anybody who's in this podcast or in this webinar is probably involved in school design. Um, there's a, a lot of opportunities out there to learn about net zero schools. But what we thought we would do is we would organize this particular um, discussion a little differently than some of the others. And um, we've separated it, it into the components that help you achieve net zero or give you the advantages of, of net zero. Um, so the first part is the design process. And technology-wise, um, not accounting for our lack of technology today, Technology in the, the school design industry now has evolved um, significantly to where that process is now sort of the easy part of the process. Um, the second one is then once you've reduced your energy usage and you need to offset that with some energy production, how do you do that? And um, typically, if you, need to, if you wanna talk about the money you need to do net zero, a lot of times this is where it comes in. Um, so Robin's going to share a lot of great information about, about that related to the two projects. And then the real crux of the, pro of the challenge is operations. So being able to get everyone involved, to be able to get the buy-in, to be able to have the right people on site, um, to be able to provide the right services throughout the op first couple years of operations, to be able to ensure that you're achieving your goal. Your goal. Um, that's really the hardest part about this process. And we're gonna spend the most time on some of those discussions today. And then once you have everybody in the room, once you have buy-in, you've set a goal, everyone's working together. The really great part is that you can use that opportunity to create the maximum benefit to the students. So you can involve that process to include educational opportunities that advantage the students, the communities, everyone involved in the net zero school. So next slide. Um, so first of all, uh, first step is you set your energy use goal. Um, the, the EUIs that we're talking about, are they building EUIs? They're not accounting for the potential of on-site offset. So I think that question came up in the chat. Site EUI, Obviously, the goal of site EUI is to be zero in the net zero building. So the EUIs that we're talking about are the um, building performance only. And it's both like when you see EUIs uh, represented for buildings, you'll see them both as design EUIs, like what's your energy model saying, and an actual performance EUI. So for net for Harbor and Graceland, we have the design EUI. For Wild Lake, we actually have a performance, the performance EUI because that school has been operating. So once you set your goal, you get buy-in, you offset re re renewable and you monitor performance. But that goal setting is sort of the key to the first step out of the gate because it gives everyone involved a sort of singular focus. Everyone can center around one goal. Okay, next slide. So what today, um, well, where we're at and why net zero is so readily achievable today versus um, how it was uh, a few years ago. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk a little bit about what you, you have to consider. And then there's a whole slew of additional items that you should and can consider as a result, but not required. So step one, where are we at today? And what are the fundamental design strategies that are involved in schools that are going to get you there? So the first, next slide. Um, so we're just going to the next slide, sorry. So the first thing is um, daylighting, building orientation and things like that. You know, this is part of every design process, right? You're, you're never gonna do a school 
that's not going to consider optimizing daylighting into the classrooms or reducing heat gain from large west facing windows. So what we found is that building envelopes today are so high performing that the orientation makes less difference than specifically looking at the, the, the large expanses of glass and where, and, and where they're located. So Hollabin and Graceland are really the exact opposite of each other. Um, the buildings are designed for the quality of light coming in the learning spaces and the orientation has less of an impact on, on that on the EUI um, than just focusing on where, where the exposure is and, and treating any windows that large expanses of west facing windows and, and things like that. So um, to the next one. When you look at classroom design, whereas you know, right at the crux of when Wild Lake was being designed, we were still looking at maximizing the fenestration to allow lighting to be turned off in the classroom because that um, you know, reduced the electricity load. Today, with LEDs being a part of every project, that's no longer, the, the math has completely changed. So you wanna look at designing for the best classroom experience. And that often means reducing the amount of glass so that you maximize the amount of, of exterior envelope because the exterior envelope really has more impact on the energy usage than the ability to turn off the lights. So this diagram shows, you know, if you wanna turn off lights in the classroom, here's how you do it. Look at the floor to ceiling glass where you've got that floor to ceiling break in your envelope, you're really negatively impacting the energy usage for your school. Obviously daylighting in every classroom, I know you all know this, it, it's a, it critical to healthy educational environments from above or from the window or just trying to maximize the way you do that is obviously a concern in, in every school. Okay, the next one. So lighting controls also. Before, you know, they, for years they were optional. Um, now they're code required in most spaces. Um, even daylighting harvesting sometimes is code required depending on the amount of penetrations you have in your exterior wall. So occupancy sensors or vacancy sensors, turning the lights off, that sort of comes with every school project today and really is one of the components that kind of helps you get there without you know, anything new or special. Okay, next. Next slide. So this is going back to talking about fenestrations. And you see in both of these schools, we have um, expanses of, of horizontal window that allow a maximum view and connection to the environment, but not the same as it used to be with really tall windows that maximize the daylight. We're maximizing the quality of the experience in the classroom while keeping that fenestration as small as possible so that we're taking advantage of the high performance building envelope. So next one. Uh, so what should your building envelope be? So you will hear a lot of information out there about ICF and most of the net zero schools are using ICF, you know, insulated concrete form construction. Um, we did use that for Hollywood and Graceland. They did not use that for Wild Lake. Um, I think when it came down to it, the decision to use ICF we did a ton of research, performance, cost. There was obviously concern about availability of manufacturers and contractors, but we were a GC bid and we weren't sure about the amount of time we were gonna have with oversight on the site. So really the decision had to do with, excuse me, minimizing the number of hands in the exterior wall so we could maximize our, our, um, our, the success of our exterior envelope. Um, so every building's different. Everyone um, should have this conversation for any school design, you know, what's the best solution for your exterior envelope. But um, the ICF has been really successful at um, Halliburton and Graceland. So next slide. I'm sorry about my cold. It's not COVID by the way. Um, so mechanical designs today. So you know, for a long time, the geothermal ground source heat pump systems were sort of leading the charge in terms of energy efficiency. And they still are, and most jurisdictions are very comfortable with geothermal systems. Um, there's some upfront cost involved, 
Um, the paybacks vary depending on, you know, how much energy costs in any given year. Um, but there was also the industry has kept up with geothermal and now there's high efficiency boilers and chillers available that almost get you as close to a geothermal system in terms of energy efficiency. And also at Tepe Water Loop, using heat pumps, but without the borehole field um, is also another option today. So mechan any mechanical system you're using for a school that <coughs> has extremely high efficiency and can help you get to net zero today, which obviously, you know, this has changed drastically over time. Okay, next slide. Okay, so there's a couple things we feel like you really have to consider. And the first one is a dedicated outdoor air system. You can go on to the next slide, I think. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me again. So most schools do have dedicated outdoor air systems. Um, I really think that uh, it, it's part of the requirements if you want to get into the EUI range where you can be net zero, it's probably one of the things you have to do. Um, the next thing is the demand controlled ventilation. So demand controlled ventilation is not new. We did our first one, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago or so. Um, the, 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 the changes in the technology that helps support those systems. And you can do demand controlled ventilation either in a one zone scenario or in a multi-zone scenario, like a typical school the, the DOAS units are often zoned to the usage, like in the diagram on the right. You can do that and still be net zero. What you'll find is that most of the net zero schools really maximize the efficiency of the ventilation system and go with a single zone ventilation system. The reason I'm mentioning the multi-zone is because it allows for maximum ventilation. And a lot of people are very concerned about that today in this time of COVID and present uh, preventing the transmission of disease, that, that multi-zone demand control ventilation system can be turned on to fully ven ventilate uh, the building. So um, the only reason I'm mentioning that is today, it's, it's a more attractive option for a lot of owners. And if they're resistant to a single zone, um, it's really valuable to talk about the, the multi-zone system. And if there's engineers involved, please speak up and correct any of my architects trying to talk about mechanical system mistakes. So uh, the other thing is to consider how you're going to account for the CO2 sensing. So that's also, you know, you have to, if you're you demand control ventilation, you're gonna be sensing CO2 and adjusting the ventilation to the number of occupants in that space. So in the past, people were very hesitant to do demand control ventilation in a school because the sensors were the weak point. And failure of the sensors often meant that the system would just not be functional for a long period of time because the schools typically didn't have staff on board to be able to do that maintenance or replacement. Most of the net zero school movement has started around a centralized air sampling system. This is a picture of the air acuity system in Hollabird or Graceland, one or the other. <laughs> Wild Lake has the same thing. It you know, literally uh, have runs tubes throughout the building. Those tubes sample air, pull back to centralized sampling units. Those sampling units then send information to the controls and they adjust the dampers in the classrooms to account for um, ventilation. Very, very reliable. So I think the comfort of the reliability of this system has led to the use of more prevalent use of demand control ventilation. This system and this provider first started their design for labs and they've been around a long time. It's a proven technology. And so, you know, personally, every one of us wants to make sure that we're, whatever we're providing in a school is fail safe. And this feels very safe um, in those regards. What's changed over time is that Obviously the industry's kept up. So CO2 sensors being designed and provided today for in classroom are significantly better performing and they're able to self calibrate and they are more durable and require um, significantly less mate, uh, maintenance. 
What I would say is though, unless you have in place or your owner, whoever you're working with, has in place a really consistent, reliable maintenance contract for, for the schools, that the sensors are still uh, as a slight risk as that they will do require independent maintenance, whereas the air acuity system is a more simple one cartridge, you know, one main location um, maintenance schedule. So just something to keep in mind. Um, there's no right answer to any of these things, but definitely a conversation to have through the design process. Okay, next one. Okay, the other thing that we feel is required is that you do um, a uh, air tightness testing. So this is a picture from the air tightness testing out at Hollabird, um, or is it Graceland? Um, that they're, they're flipped, so you can't ever tell. But so the air tightness, and this goes back to your building envelope um, design. The, the air tightness is a critical component in the success of the net zero operations. So putting that in the spec, um, making sure that the contractor is aware that they're responsible for failures in this air tightness testing is critical to the achieving success. Now, you know, it's always a challenge if you fail the air tightness testing, the building's already built. It's a challenge to solve. So being proactive up front um, and making sure that everyone's aware that this is going to happen, making sure that there are eyes on the exterior envelope as it's getting built. Hopefully you're taking pictures. Um, hopefully you're ensuring that you pass this test, but it's really important to have that, uh, you know, the information there so that there's a standard that everyone understands they have to achieve. Okay, next. And then, the, and then the, the last, I think the last thing is that you have to be able to build your energy model in as accurate a way as possible. Um, a lot of times it's really difficult to get the information up front regarding the actual plan operation of a building. I mean, everybody knows what the school day is going to be, but the questions are, what about after hours use? What about sports uses? What about community usage? You know, community rentals, you, it's really difficult to, to predict. What about summer hours? What about before and after school care? There are a lot of components that go into how a school operates outside of the typical day. And the more information you get up front about that, the better off you can, uh, the better, the better, more accurate your energy model is. So the more accurate you're going to be in terms of the actual operation cost and the quantity of energy offset you're going to need. So this is probably one of the hardest parts of the design process is, is getting this information to a level of accuracy where you are confident in your planning. And typically, I, you know, every school that we've been involved in, I know I think some of Robin's stories is going to, um, you know, show you the same thing is that the level of confidence is never 100%. So we're always doing a little bit more. And hopefully the goal EUI is, ends up being actually higher than the actual EUI because you're building in a little bit of that, of that cushion. So next slide. Okay, this is a pie chart. Everyone's used to looking at these energy pie charts, I know. Um, the big line going through is the difference between the energy use that occupants impact and the energy use that the design impacts. So we're talking about design and all the components that go into that. But in reality, that's a really small part of it. Without talking about the behavior inside the building, the operations of the building and how that's gonna happen, um, you, you're not gonna achieve the goal. The design components, again, are the easy part. The occupant behavior is where it, it's, in the operations is where it starts to get challenging. So next, next slide, and we're gonna talk a lot more about that. Okay, in terms of what else to do. So you've got everybody at the table, um, you know, the, everyone's involved in the conversation from the person cleaning the building to the su assistant superintendent, and you're having these collaborative design processes. 
you want to take advantage of having everyone at the table. Um, you know, the, the getting to that reduced EUI, um, like, you know, all of the strategies you just talked about, it's not that hard. But when you have everyone at the table, you can take advantage of those conversations to really optimize the design and a, a beat your goal. And, you know, like Wild Lake, Mac, you know, way far exceed the ex expectations of what your goal is. And so some of those things, this is obviously not a complete list. This is the first things you want to talk about. Some of those involve plug load controls, having automated systems to turn off plug loads. So you're not relying on human behavior to do that. You can rely on human behavior. There's nothing wrong, of, wrong with that. You just need people on site to be sure to be monitoring that. Plug load controls takes that risk away. A lot of discussion about kitchen redesign. You know, the kitchen becomes a very large component of your energy usage once you reduce the, the load from the mechanical system. So thinking specifically about the equipment, um, the equipment really can be just a small tweak. It can be that you actually have an owner who's willing to do a no cooking day, a packed lunch day, so you can turn that kitchen off for one day out of every week or something like that. <clears throat> you are also want to talk about the actual design of the kitchens, like the walk-ins going through the refrigeration unit to get to the freezer unit. It's become a more common design approach today. Um, obviously something you want to talk about. Uh, we've looked at a little bit of the, the, the facade shading. Um, so you can maximize that reduction in energy from that we're heating, we're, we're cooling load dominant in this environment. So uh, reducing heating loads is the, is the critical component to reducing the size of your mechanical system. So that's one way to sort of offset the, uh, the, the cost of the PV is to reduce the cost of the mechanical systems by downsizing some of those. And then finally, um, you, if you are designing to achieve net zero with PV on the roof, you wanna look at the building massing. So we'll, I think we talked a little bit about how that impacted Halliburton and Graceland throughout the design process. So, you know, these are, are bonus options, but the list of things while you have everyone at the table, um, every standard has the opportunity to be reconsidered and evaluated and not just against the goal of the net zero, but also just against the, the life cycle cost of the building and this ultimate sustainability of the building, plus the um, potential benefits it brings to the students inside. And um, I believe that's my last slide and I'm gonna turn it back over to Robin. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, I'll be building on what Melissa talked about because um, she made a lot of points that are relevant also to Wild Lake. Um, but the big question always comes when you're talking to net zero is, um, you know, what sets apart a high performance building that we've all been designing or energy efficient building is the PV panels that are offsetting the energy used by the building. Next. We have found through our experience that it's easy to get buy-in from all the stakeholders when you talk about energy efficient, because the energy efficient building costs less to operate. So one of the things to remember is as you reduce your energy consumption, we talked about this earlier, it'll reduce the amount of money spent on your renewable energy. So just a reminder of that, next. Um, because as you can see here, once the building is designed, the PV array will be sized to meet the energy needs and to achieve the net zero. And you can see on both of these projects, on the left is the roof from Wild Lake, on the right is either Graceland or Hollybird, not sure which one, but the entire roof surface is pretty much covered with roof, um, with PV arrays. And in both projects, we had to augment um, at Wild Lake. We have a ground mounted system, which is nice because the students get to see it as they come and go and visitors um, from the school. It's right at the entrance um, at the site. And then Graceland and Hollybird has um, some PV in their solar lab. And then they also 
um, use transparent PV at their entrance canopy. So again, right at the main entrance to remind everybody of um, what is powering their buildings. Next. Um, this is from our model. As I mentioned before, we were taking an existing prototype and transforming it to become net zero. So it was very important for us to understand the volume of the building. Um, I believe Melissa already was talking about the massing. You really want to have very simple volume with only a few transitions in roof height. Amy, if you play again, thank you. Um, we have a tall volume on the right-hand side. That's the two-story classroom wing. We raised in the center core is your gym and cafeteria. We raised that up so that it was at the same height and we wouldn't get shadows from the two-story. And then the left-hand side is where the service area and the music rooms and the admin suite, those were actually at a couple varied heights. We raised that all up to one volume um, to maximize the panels and to make sure that um, we would get the most out of our panels. Um, if you hadn't figured it out, up uh, the top of your screen is south facing. Um, so again, modeling is very important as you're going through this process. Um, as Melissa was saying, you know, there's there's a lot of things that you are predicting um, when it comes to the occupant behavior when you leave the building. So as the designers, you want to take out, out as many of those unknowns as possible, and modeling really helps that out. Next. Um, Lessons learned, um, people always ask about the funding for a net zero building. Um, one of the common, common kind of misconceptions is that everyone thinks if you have net zero energy, that means you have a zero energy bill. Um, that is not actually true. Um, you will have connection fees to the utility. And um, when you are getting, when you're paying for the energy in the winter months, um, you will be paying at a higher rate than in the summer months when you are giving the energy back to the grid. So even though you're net zero energy, um, you will actually pay more for what you use um, than you will get back when you are giving it. Um, so it is imperative at the early project that you understand how your project's gonna be funded. How are the PV panels going to be purchased? Um, the projects we're working on um, and presented today um, received a grant to assist with this net zero goal. So there are other programs that might be out there. It's good to look out there and find, um, find those as options. Um, in addition, we both received um, money through the MGE Smart Savers Energy Rebate Program. Those funds come after um, for saving energy. Um, so another option that's out there or something similar might be near you. Um, but it's important to make sure that those holding the purse strings on a are on board with the funding for the PV and the concepts, design concepts that Melissa was talking about earlier that are really required for the energy efficiency um, and to get you to a net zero project. Next. Um, once you start talking about PV systems, everybody wants to know, um, are you gonna own the system? Are you gonna have SREX? Um, are you gonna have a PPA? Um, so it's important to understand these different options. Next. Um, oh, excuse me, I forgot to mention that um, it is our understanding that it, to truly certify your building as a net zero, you will need to own the system at that time. Um, the other two options with the SREX, um, which is a financial benefit to the owner, that owner would own the system and then they sell their solar renewable energy certificates, which are called SRECs. And each of these RECs are created for every megawatt hour of electricity generated and then delivered to the grid and then is traded kind of like Wall Street <laughs> out there on the market. And the one caveat to that is the rights to claiming renewable energy use is legally connected to whoever owns that REC. So that's why um, for both of our systems at this time, the school systems own their, um, own their PV system so that they can claim their net zero status. The other option, um, next Amy. 
Next slide. Um, thank you. Um, is a PPA agreement. This is a solar power purchase agreement. This is when someone comes to you, says they'll put up the cost, they'll put the panels on your building. So the owner is just um, providing the surface area and the space for the um, for the panels. And then usually there's an agreement where they get a lower cost for the energy used through those panels. But again, um, the panels are owned by the developer. And it is my understanding that you're not necessarily able to claim that for net zero. Next slide. Another common questions that come up um, as people want to learn more about net zero. What is the return on investment? And is solar really worth it? It's a very common complicated question to ask that has many layers and levels of um, consideration. It's easy to quantify how much a PV system will cost to install and to compare that with the number of the, the number of the cost that the energy would pay in utility bills. That's an easy um, equation. The problem with the school system is they're a very large entity and they get a discounted rate from the utility systems. So to try and get a return on re investment within 20 years, which in theory is what um, systems are supposed to last for at this point or warrantied for, um, it's hard to get that to be a 20 year return on investment. But that number doesn't show other costs that the school system is going to be saving. Um, it's hard to quantify energy efficient items that have built in, which will be saved in operating costs in other ways. So the owner really needs to balance the costs and the sustainable goals and look at life cycle cost analysis of operating and maintaining the entire building. Next. These are some examples, as Melissa was saying, um, it is very important from the beginning of the project to get all the stakeholders at the, together at the table. We had multiple charrettes throughout the Wild Lake process, um, being that it was the first in Maryland, um, needless to say, everyone was very nervous and um, wanted to make sure it was a successful project. It was, um, there wasn't actually another net zero school completed in our region, there were only 12 certified buildings at the time, school buildings. So um, we were all very nervous about not achieving the goal um, in this area with the expectations. So some of the considerations that are, again, hard to quantify, um, you know, being able to focus on daylight and providing a beautiful building that is teaching the students, it's reducing the sick days for teachers, it's enhancing learning for the students. You know, that's hard to quantify in dollars, but we all know is a good thing to do and to design. Um, one of the things that we looked at um, for this project, this is actually um, the elementary school that came afterwards, is the flooring system in the corridors. Um, typically, the standard in the county had been to install VCT, which every six months, um, the staff comes in, they use the energy and equipment to strip all of the, um, the wax off of the VCT. And then they go and put 10 coats of wax on and start over that process in another six months. So there's cost in the labor, the energy of having the building on and occupied, the energy of using all the, mechan um, the machinery, and then also the materials needed to do the wax waxing of the VCT. It was decided to use um, VCT, I mean, excuse me, um, Terrazzo, which has a more expensive upfront cost, um, but it has a much better life cycle cost um, at Wild Lake. It was so successful. It has now become a standard in their quarters and their, um, and their cafeterias and these high traffic areas. So again, um, kind of a hard financial um, thing to quantify. Some smaller details um, that came up when we were going through the design process was just talking to people and finding out um, if things are just done because they've always been done, kind of like having printers all over the school, everyone brings one in. Next thing you know, we're talking to the media specialist. She has all of these storage shelves that take square footage in a building because everyone's got a different type of printer and she's got to be able to support all of these different types of printers. So in talking about the energy used by these printers, it was decided to have some 
localized um, areas throughout the building with a larger printer. So it was easy to get to, but it was, you know, they could all have the same cartridges. It would be more efficient, um, both in maintenance and in energy. Um, another example was the dust collector. Um, when we were going through all the questionnaires and trying to understand how often it was used, we found out it really wasn't being used. So they decided they would much rather have that space for a 3D printer and you know, do that. And so we were able to kind of change, you know, have the stakeholders look back at their standards and reevaluate them all because we started having questions about energy use and operational use. So it's very important to ask every question. You know, we kept saying we left no stone unturned during the design process of, process of Wild Lake. And it was really successful, not only for that project, but has been successful for every project since with them that, you know, they're just open-minded to reconsidering, you know, are we doing these things because we need to be doing them or because we've always been doing them? Yeah, and if, if I could just chime in to the tag on to that, Robin, um, for Hollywood and Graceland, we did have a, a new ed spec that Baltimore City had developed. So we had um, already some questions had been asked and, um, but, but we still had the same discussions with that school system about things like printers. Um, and we did discuss how we had uh, classroom clusters for each of the age groups on, in the classroom wing. And there's a, a open collaborative learning commons in between the classrooms and there's a a very glassy teacher planning room that serves each of those clusters. And uh, we tried to always focus on positives for them and not talk about take, like, of course we're taking away all their individual printers, but we were focusing on, you have a, a localized sort of centrally um, set teacher planning and workspace. And, and there you can have, you know, a printer for everyone to share, or there's a lounge nearby that serves the whole floor and in there you can have a fridge and we can make it a, an Energy Star compliant full-size fridge for you because everyone's gonna come there. And so it's a great place for everyone to share ideas. So always trying to frame these changes to them in a positive way and in a way that um, they get buy-in early on. Uh, same thing with the flooring, we didn't do VCT, which was normal. We did a bio-based tile that had uh, less maintenance on it specifically for the same reason of of avoiding the waxing and the stripping and the, the ongoing maintenance cost for that. And that all tied in with life cycle discussions. So we had some of the same discussions. Just to add on to that, Amy, about framing the conversation, um, I had an interesting comment from one of the teachers at Wild Lake. Someone was asking about the printers and he said, well, he goes, you know, it, you do have to get up and you have to walk. He said, but they are tracking our steps. So he goes, I guess it's a net zero. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it, it is, it's how you frame it and, and how you get everybody to buy in. And I don't know if, I can't remember if we mentioned it later on, but we had about three um, kind of collaborative presentations with the staff because there wasn't existing staff for Wild Lake with it being a replacement school to get them ready and to get their input, not just in the design development meetings, but also to go around and, you know, have them understand what's coming and um, ask their questions before the building was going to be occupied. Um, another question when it comes to money is, or one of the challenges, is everything is changing so quickly. Technology is changing quickly. Codes are changing. Um, costs are changing. Everything is um, kind of a moving target. Um, so here we're showing you just the difference in the systems. Our systems are pretty comparable um, given that our EUIs are the same and our building size is, is relatively similar. Um, but the cost of the system for us in February of 2015 was 1.4 million. And if you look on the right-hand side, you can see that the estimates for Hollybird and Graceland went from, it looks like the estimates started at um, 1.6 million, and by the time they actually bought the system in 2020, it was down to 1 million. So it's getting cheaper to buy PV panels, and they're also becoming more efficient. Um, an interesting story for Wild Lake was we had designed for 300 watt panels. By the time they went to go and purchase them, they were no longer available. They had to get 310 watts, which were more efficient, and that ground mounted. Um, 
array that I mentioned earlier actually was, was reduced by a third um, when they did the math and figured out what a 310 would um, do versus um, the space required for a 310 watt versus 300. So as this keeps changing and they become more efficient, the nice thing is it will take less space and hopefully it's getting cheaper to buy these panels. So that's a very exciting thing to understand. But again, it's a moving target when you're trying to predict what the cost will be when it comes time for bid day and, um, and then installation. Um, planning for success. Like I said, um, Wild Lake was the first uh, net zero in the state of Maryland, and there actually wasn't another one that was completed in the region. So um, the owner decided to really ensure some things were predictable. We were trying to have the, as much predictable predictability as possible. So we had no alternates on the project. We designed everything in. So everything on bid day was what we were going to end up with. And it's what we had in our energy models for success. So um, since then, for example, Terrazzo on their next couple of projects have been an alternate. They've been able to be accepted, but they were alternates. Um, the other thing was there was really not no real um, consideration for changes or substitutions during the um, during construction. We really tried to keep things predictable. Um, the only substitution I think was the the change in the PV panels. But um, and then the other thing that um, the owner did um, and we helped them with was they went through the process of pre qualifying the PV contractors, because again, it wasn't very common at that time. And so we wanted to make sure that we got someone who understood what they were doing. Um, so that was another um, strategy to um, make sure the project was successful on bid day and when it would um, be trying to get certification for net zero. Amy, do you wanna talk about yours? Sure, yeah. Um as Robin had mentioned before, when you had this sort of side-by-side -side graph, our, our projects were um, delivered design bid build. So it was a um, you know, low GC bid and we had bid the two projects together. So it was a combined amount, which, which actually helped um, be able to get enough coverage for some of the trades to do both buildings at once. Um, they're actually only about three or four blocks apart. Um, so very close, but just far enough to, you know, make them two separate projects. And we did have alternates for various things. The two projects, they came in below state average that included the PV and, and site. So we were able to take some of those alternates. And the ones that we're really proud of um, are shown on the right. There's a transparent PV canopy that Robin had mentioned. And on our solar lab, we have a little section of vegetative roof. We have a dual access tracker and some fixed access panels. Um, for the kids, there's all separate microinverters on all of those from the main array. And so, you know, they can see the efficacy of the different types of panels. The main workhorse panels are the ones on the roofs. These contribute, um, you know, not that much in the grand scheme of things, but they can see from the ground uh, as they look up below what they're walking in and they can see, you know, and sort of infer what's on the roof. They can go out on that a very defensible upper um, patio and they can look on the lower array and see those and they can see the dual access tracker following the sun um, from the ground or from that upper roof. And um, we, we just really lucked out with a great GC cam construction and they coordinated really well with the PV and the electrical subcontractors. And because uh, our MEP engineer, well, our, um, we, had, we had split MEP, but um, CMTA handled the mechanical and the lighting and the PV design. And then we had SETI Associates, they did plumbing and power. And so it was a great collaboration between the two of them, but we were able to do a lot of iterative um, PV designs throughout and then check the substitution requests because we did get a few substitution requests for the PV over the course of construction because the panels were changing. So rapidly in, um, in performance. And so CMTA was able to just check it against the design and verify if it was a, you know, a good substitution. So it was, it was a, we were, had a great team. Um, and again, back to what Melissa was talking about in the design section, you know, for success, it's good to verify your air barrier, 
This is becoming more common with lead in the IGCC and building envelope commissioning. All of that is stuff that um, is you know, becoming more common. It was not <laughs> when we did Wild Lake. We had never had a building air tested. Um, and I don't know if anybody on the construction team had. <laughs> So, um, but it was very important and it's interesting in talking um, with Amy and Melissa, both of these projects were very successful, even though we had very different building envelopes. Um, ours was the traditional cavity and theirs was with the ICF and both of us had the same response from the, um, the tester that they had, you know, not seen a result that good. Um, in their testing. So, you know, making sure you're watching for quality control and then you're verifying the contractor's work and, you know, having them know upfront in the spec during the pre-con meeting that this is going to happen. Just kind of make sure everyone's on their A-game um, and really helps to the success of the project and for a successful operating budget for the owner long-term. Yeah, and there was a question in the chat during Melissa's section if if this could, you know, is done or was done by the commissioning agent or if by contractor. We've seen it uh, done various ways. Uh, it could be written as a performance spec. It could be handed to the contractor that they need to hire a third party to do this and to coordinate it. Um, you know, you could have the commissioning agent do it. Our commissioning agent did do the test, but the contractor paid them so we they basically hired uh the commissioning agent who was cmta we had two commissioning agents ben who spoke at the beginning was one of our commissioning agents and then cmta also did some commissioning on the project and so uh we've seen it delivered in in either way the big thing that robin had mentioned i think really was a key to the success was early and often discussions lots of pre-cons about it making sure that they have like a really proactive checklist um, for the either construction manager and subs or the GC to make sure that they have the right outlets labeled on, on testing day, that they have sealed up, like have a lot of walkthroughs and make sure that a lot of the penetrations are sealed up. Um, we didn't have a building envelope commissioning agent on Halliburton Graceland. We just had a mechanical uh, commissioning. Um, and so it just fell to us as the architects and the whole team and the contractor just to make sure that we had properly sealed all the nooks and crannies of it. Um, so anyway, uh, like Robin said, our numbers typical design to is 0.25 CFM um, or, or even 0.4 and we had 0.05 and 0.04 and Robin's um, were extremely low as well, 0.06 and 0.08. So um, you know, the numbers came in really good. It's a really tight building. So that's why having a lot of really good controlled fresh air is also very important. And Amy, we didn't have a building commit envelope commissioner on our project either. Since then, um, our owner has decided to, to add that on just to get that insurance. Um, but yeah, that's another, another trend and things changing. <laughs> right. Um, I guess we, you know, there has been some chat questions going on throughout that we've been trying to pick up, but we do have uh, part part C and D, and we're going to go quicker on those to end in time. But if anybody wanted to unmute right now and just ask any questions, um, you know, we put some facts on here. Obviously, like when Robin mentioned, when they were designing Wild Lake, there were only just a couple dozen of um, net zero buildings that were done, and now there's Cert, or sort of verified by the NBI 136, but there's 547 on track as emerging. Uh, Hollywood and Graceland are two of those. So, um, so it's just exponential, the amount of, of zero energy buildings that are out there getting tracked and emerging. So if anyone has any questions, either feel free to continue in the chat or you can unmute. Um, I see there's one question about the roofing system. We've seen multiple roofing systems used. Um, so that hasn't been as much of the issue. Um, and the supports that we used were ballasted. They're not penetrating the roof. Um, and all of the um, panels are angled. So the roof drains, um, the water is able to drain through them. So they're not laying flat on the roof. They just are perceived as such. I don't know if we have a good picture Amy, if you go yeah, back. Yeah, they're like, like a 10% yeah. 
Yeah, they're slope. angled. They, and that's so another part of the efficiency low. Um, is that, uh, you know, what angle is going to be the most efficient at that area, that region. So that can vary. All right. Uh, the well, one thing you do need to pay attention to is making sure that your roof structure can handle the weight of not just the panels, but the, if you go back, there were CMU units that are holding down the ballast for wind uplift. Um, so that's a consideration when people are asking if you can put PV systems on an existing building that was not designed for that use someone needs to go through and make sure that they do those calculations to make sure the roof can handle that extra weight. Right. I mean, there's always like the peel and stick type of PV, which adheres directly to the roof. It's not as efficient as these and has a different lifespan for the roof. But um, we did the self-ballasted too. That seems to be pretty standard, not just for leased systems like through a PPA, but also the purchase systems like ours, ours both were. And it's also nice because if there is any issues with maintenance, it can be moved. And whenever the roof does need to be replaced, it can be easily removed again. Um, so when it's self ballasted and it's not penetrating yep. the roof. So it's a, uh, that was one of the things, again, getting everyone at the table, the maintenance department was very concerned about this system and what it was going to add to their um, maintenance load. Um, one of the things we built into Wild Lake's bid set was we did build in a, um, a maintenance plan was part of the PV system when it was bid. So they have, I cannot remember at this point if it was three to five years, um, where the contractor was going to maintain the, um, the system and make sure that it was cleaned of debris and things like that if needed and that it was working. Um, so that's one thing to consider. It hasn't become an issue. Um, it hasn't been a big maintenance issue, but you know, again, there was concern about it because it was new. Yeah, and it seems like it's, it's actually, you know, it's that short window between you have trades you know, walking around and, and finishing metal panel or installing things on, on adjacent walls and dropping screws and, and, and puncturing the roof, getting good um, testing on, on, on either flood testing or EVFM testing on the roof is, is a great um, just comfort for everyone if you do that prior to putting the panels on. Uh, but then once the panels are on, I mean, they're really protecting the roof as well. Like they sort of set them and forget them. They're not puncturing through. They're just resting on the roof. Depending on the type of roof, the manufacturer for the roof uh, membrane may want you to put a slip sheet. Uh, it's, it all depends. Like you pretty much just have to make sure that you have compatibility and don't mess the warranty of your roof system. But there's so much um, just collaboration between the roof membrane and, and the PV, it's, um, it hasn't been a problem recently. But that, that does take us into operations, right? Um, and, and this is actually my section, but Robin and Melissa will probably be chiming in as well. Uh, a lot of these uh, sort of summary items have been mentioned already. Just again, having these early charrettes or work sessions or meetings or around the room discussions, whatever you wanna call them and, and making sure that you can get facilities, maintenance, operational um, people from the owner side, from the actual, you know, ideally even who is actually gonna be operating the building, have them at these meetings early and often all the way from the beginning of design to make sure that the goals are realistic and actionable. Um, understanding those operational schedules, as Melissa said, that's often some of the hardest part to get because uh, you know it's just they may think they know how their building is being uh, scheduled and, and the, pop, the, the occupancy within the school or the building but you know really trying to get the real numbers because we want to have a realistic energy model and and not pad it right um, and then also just understanding how energy usage will be monitored who's going to be monitoring it who's going to be the champion of of being able to be responsive if something falls out of whack or gets turned off mistakenly. Um, and then again, just using that filter of keeping it simple has been a great, um, great mantra for us for these projects because 
you know, you can look at the pie chart and change the wedges. Like, you know, your HVAC gets really efficient. The lighting is all LED. It's extremely efficient. The other wedges for like plug loads, kitchen IT get bigger in that they have more of an impact on your overall energy consumption. So you're focusing more on things like, you know, the kitchen equipment or IT. And you're talking about things like wireless, um, you know, blade servers and, you know, Wi-Fi stuff and all of that. But overarching on all of that is the behavior, right? Um, we can do it the best we can to design and deliver and commission these buildings. Um, but then it, it, for it to really be a successful zero energy building, it, it comes down to behavior. And so attentive O&M and occupant behavior obviously is, is very critical. And, um, you know, when we were looking, this is just another way to show that sort of as the energy efficiency increases or as the energy consumed goes down, the, the PV that you need to buy to offset um, the, the energy use also comes down. This is just another graph in which to show it where we actually mapped for Halbert and Graceland the existing EUI for each of those schools because we're replacing the schools just like Wild Lake was a replacement school on the same site, so are Halliburton and Graceland. Um, we built them right next to their existing schools. And you can see that the numbers are just astronomical. The EUI for Halliburton was 82 and for Graceland, at, you know, the year that we were designing it was operating at a 106. So in talking to them about how we're, we're having a goal of below 25 and we're targeting around 19 to 21 in our energy modeling, um, you know, that's, that's like a quarter of, of how that building is, is what they're used to operating a building at, um, that that's a quarter of that. And so we can get there a lot, very, a lot of the way with our design, with designing great passive strategies and designing great active strategies with very efficient equipment. But then there's also the overlay of occupants, like operating that building and understanding that they need to operate it differently. So Lots of different ways to engage people. These are just some of the examples of the ways that we did it. And we just took a multi-prong approach, right? I mentioned that the two schools, Halbert and Graceland are very close to each other. They're about three or four blocks, depending on how you count the city blocks apart. Um, so ideally we wanted them to be peer groups. So we tried to have as many meetings as possible with all the stakeholders together. Um, but it's really, uh, it was hard to get all of them to come to the same meetings. So we still had to have double meetings often. Um, we listened to a lot of their concerns. We asked, uh, we did a lot of surveys and asked about uh, operations. We have at both of those schools, a 3000 square foot each community partnership zone of a, of a building, which we didn't know what was gonna go in there. So we had to be conservative in our energy models and assume very high energy usage, like maybe there's a small gym, like a fitness center, um, which is actually what is going in one of the schools. Um, and uh, we talked about how to how repair tickets will be tracked, who's going to respond to them. We tried to see if there was a way to get facility, like a dedicated facility manager at each of the schools that could just be dedicated to them and understanding and operating them. But that that isn't how Baltimore City works. So um, so just making sure that we uh, engage them with other peer groups. Um, nationally, we talked with people in Kentucky through CMTA with other schools there, and they talked with IT folks and kitchen folks there. Um, we had a lot of great engagement sessions, just like uh, Robin mentioned that they did at Wild Lake. We uh, talked about perceived obstacles, obstacles, perceived opportunities. We had everybody in the charrettes write down their personal commitment uh, like what they would do. And it may have ranged from, I will have my staff, like a principal said, she would have her staff attend every meeting that we asked them to attend. Um, and then uh, operators said that they would, you know, um, follow the operating manuals and maintenance reports for the buildings. And that's all you could ask for. Uh, we took our, our teachers and our um, facilities folks for the Baltimore City Schools on tours of the other net zero buildings um, that were similar. So we went down to uh, VMDO's Discovery in Arlington. We went to Wild Lake and we saw the air acuity system and their, their amazing energy dashboard. We saw the solar on the roof and um, it was really helpful to see all that. Uh, we used our Revit model and we 
through Enscape, like turned all the walls and everything into um, like 3D sort of x-ray mode and then used it to walk through like a video game, the mechanical systems um, for the facilities folks so that they could see some of those spaces um, even before they were built so that they could understand where the pump room was and why it was where it was and where the pumps connected to for the heat pumps within the uh, near the classrooms and in the DOAS unit and how much space they actually had up there in that main mechanical room um, so that they could have a comfort level of the equipment. Um, and then Robin, I don't know if you want to chime in. I know Melissa sort of covered these charts already, but. In looking at time, Amy, I think we've we'll hit that keep point. Keep yep. <laughs> All right, cool. So um, again, we. Um, I would say though that there's also, you, you ask all these questions and then you still ask them again after they're actually in the building because you can get everyone's attention as much as possible when they're when you're designing it. But still, once they're in the building and they have the training and they see and they understand the labeling of you know the different jacks or the different outlets and the color coding for the outlets and which outlets are switched and which ones aren't and um, all of that, you know, the engagement just happens over and over again. I mean, we have done multiple training for the occupants, but, um, and I know Robin has at, at Wild Lake, and we had a little timeline where we talked about all the different ways over the years for Halliburton and Graceland that we would engage the students and the teachers and the facility folks and the staff. And it was everything from uh, like Green Apple Day events, and we showed them little demonstration PV panels and little demonstration vegetative roofs and we poured water through it to explain how you know how everything worked and we showed them an ICF block we painted a sundial on their existing school plazas uh, we took the kids on construction tours at certain ages um, and talked to them in their classrooms about the careers that that could happen for them in the future um, one teacher got really handy with his 3D, um, like his little 3D printer and he printed little pieces and he had us come in and talk to the kids about the plans and sections of their building. And then they built a little gingerbread scale model using some of those plastic pieces and some gingerbread pieces of the school and then invited us back and showed it to us. And, um, you know, every, 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 step of the way, we, we try to engage the users. Um, when we did our conductivity test well at each site, we, we alerted the schools in Spanish and English. And uh, some of the kids came out and painted little uh, well driller paintings for the kit, you know, for the, for the, the guys that were drilling the wells. Um, we also have been building a sort of custom uh, virtual reality 3D view um, dashboard experience that also can be used on a phone or an iPad or Google Goggle. Um, and then it, it includes the um, energy dashboard information in there that can be exported out and used in classrooms uh, as charts and um, spreadsheets. Um, and then in the 360 views of the rooms, we tried to focus on spaces that the kids spend all day in, like their classrooms, and there's little icons or hot, hot spots that they could click on or look at, you know, if they're in a goggle situation, they can look at um, and pause at, and then it'll pull up some more information that's age appropriate about that strategy or, or piece of equipment or design method. Um, and it, it might have been, again, their classroom or even the mechanical room in which they're not going and spending any time in. Uh, and we worked, because it was school, we, we had the benefit of working with curriculum folks to make sure that the diagrams for and the words that we used for each of the um, little hot spot points or little tags made sense and built on lesson planning that they already had and they were developing and then also let the kids matriculate through the school because these two schools aren't a middle school like at Wild Lake they're pre-k through grade eight so it's three-year-olds all the way up to 12-year-olds um like sort of adult size kids and so we wanted to make sure that this stuff stayed fresh um we made little maps that can become fortune tellers um made signs Everybody makes a lot of signs, but we also tried to make sure that we used uh, some terminology in there and um, QR codes and things that could spur thoughts about careers in the future for the, the kids. Um, we exposed walls. We were more 
um, ad, like um, obvious and explicit about it this time where we put windows and doors and put signs next to it saying like, this is what you're looking at. We cut holes in the walls to show them what the ICF was. Um, if we had chases and we had windows in the chases, we had timer lights on there and everything was labeled to sort of explain what they're looking at. Um, so trying to just, you know, again, have passive education and real active education, um, do consulting, worked for the owner at Baltimore City Schools and, and has been creating these net zero stories and they've been in uh, Spanish and English and the intent was that all throughout construction, the kids could take these home or access them now on the dashboard and, and read about the, the main strategies that made their school different um, and contributed to net zero. Uh, again, we had virtual training and in-person training because our two schools opened up in um, during COVID. So for the first year, essentially last year, very few kids were actually there in person, very few teachers were. So it really started over summer school when we got closer to full occupancy. So trying to continue to engage the teachers this year has been um, a focus on for all of us. And then um, these are photos, not from the new school, but from the former schools, but city schools, Maurice specifically, he's a project manager for Baltimore city schools for both buildings. He does a lot of walkthroughs and really reminds everybody, you know, you can't have all these personal appliances. Please remember that you have them in your centralized teaching spaces. Um, again, we worked with the curriculum folks to make sure that there's actual lesson plans that can be supported by the design of the buildings. And we made a lot of videos. Um, City Schools made some videos. Grandma Parker made some videos to try to explain this. I mean, trying to talk about energy, which is invisible um, for years before a shovel even hits the ground is really hard to get people's attention and to explain it and demystify it. So try to find some unique ways to reach out and explain to these kids because by the time the schools open, those kids that maybe were in kindergarten doing the gingerbread house now, you know, we're in second grade or third grade and, um, and they're the sustainability natives then that are leading the tours. So, um, and then Robin, uh, Here's some screenshots of the Wild Lake dashboard, which is also extremely helpful. Oh, yeah, Jillian. Can you see yeah. I can go yeah. Over. So, you know, I know many people are architects and most of us are probably school designers, but um, not every net zero school or building is going to be a school. Um, so some of the things that we did at Wild Lake and, and even what was at Hollabird are transferable to any project. So the dashboard is great to be able to show. Can you go back one, Amy? Yep. Um, again, that energy production. So, you know, you've got, I'm trying to see here, the green I think is the production and um, the yellow is the consumption. So they can see how that is working. Um, at their own building and how they're influencing things. Um, and then at the bottom, there's other green features that you can educate the community about. Um, some buildings actually have public links, some do not. Um, but another option is to use these um, web-based um, solutions to inform everybody. The next one, Amy, is just kind of theming, you know, in Wild Lake, we tried to use the sun graphic throughout. And of course, their school colors were already blue. We added yellow to it and just reminding them what the building was being powered by as they go through. Next, um, for wayfinding, we took all of the four major intersections, which happened to the walls behind them are all science labs, which helped the science teachers were very excited about these um areas um, so as they're going down each hall they're reminded of other ways energy can be um, generated so you know here sun is the most um, popular there's other places where windmills are more popular um, they do have the geothermal there's places where you know getting harvesting energy from the water is is more popular so it's been neat for the science teachers to be able to educate the students um, and have them aware next um, and then one of the, oh, can you go back one? One of their favorite um, 
features is this human sundial. Um, I actually tried to take a picture uh, last week um, to show it um, updated, but apparently it is also an outdoor classroom and has become a very popular um, hangout um, for the students and the teachers and is right now uh, a lot of mud and dirt, <laughs> so it's being heavily used. But the center of this amphitheater, you can see the person in the center there, when they hold up their arm, it'll show the kids what time it is. So the sun shadow is actually functioning um, with um, as a clock for the students, again, showing their connection to the sun and reminding them that it's all connected. Uh, finally, and just signage. Um, I think Amy had a, had a slide earlier that showed kind of your park signage that you see at national parks um, that you can do in the exterior area to educate them, you know, have them understand about stormwater management and other sustainable features. And then of course you can have informational signage, you know, kind of like a museum that's around the building and helps them learn as they're going around um, different places. I think that's it. Oh, good. We have a little bit of time for question and answers. Um, the one thing I, I didn't know from the chat, someone was asking about the generator. Another kind of fun fact is everyone thinks that if Wild Lake, if the power goes out in Howard County, that Wild Lake will still run. Not true. Um, since it is connected to the grid, it would be turned off also for emergencies. Um, there is a gas generator and um, Someone was asking if they ever thought there would be um, battery consumption or battery storage on the site. And at this point, when we were doing it five years ago, I don't know if it was a consideration for Baltimore City, um, the amount of space that would be required to house that many batteries and you know concerns with that um, just made it prohibitive. Um, but again, things are changing constantly. So, um, and there's different systems going out for generators that that might change over time. So just a quick wrap up, um, you know, re reiterating what we've already said. Um, the first is, you know, technology today, uh, net zero is almost there in any school design. Um, second thing is, um, uh, take the uh, opportunity to work toward this mutual goal to engage as many occupants as possible and um, and that working together uh, throughout the process brings multiple benefits to the building and to the students beyond just you know creating a uh, zero energy um, school building. So to leave leave time for questions, this has been a long webinar, but we do have a few minutes left. Um, for additional questions, if anybody um, has any that haven't been put into the, the chat yet. Also, I stopped sharing it in case anybody wants to turn on their cameras and see people, but um, how does an architect not lose money on these projects? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's sort of like early days of lead, right? There's a little bit of a learning curve and you need to um, commit yourself to that learning curve and also enthusiasm and excitement and you wanna make sure that they achieve their goals. Um, you know, that's why Melissa had pointed out that we've been trying to sort of put these things in like little buckets of like what's absolutely required. You know, yes, there's some extra meetings and extra engagement and you should absolutely get uh, paid for some extra above and beyond meetings. And if you're going to be doing sticking around the project longer than normal and having some post occupancy tinkering or optimization for net zero, um, as the architect, you're also going to be involved in some of those, even though it's probably your mechanical engineers more and commissioning agents. So making sure that you look ahead and identify those as potential additional services, you can break out signage and dashboard design as, as extra um, services and quantify that. Um, but it is a little bit of also a, a learning curve in the beginning for, for some teams just to be able to get your arms around and get everybody at the table and get everybody engaged because it does take multi, it's like a multifaceted approach and, and it could, it extends over years, so. It is challenging though, because when you go propose to an owner, that they can be net zero. Um, you know, like when Halliburton and Graceland, 
the we really proposed that we would be designing within the the state's cost per square foot budget and and then you have to say oh but you're gonna have to pass more because you need more time from us you know we bit we get paid for time um and there is time that goes into um you know the the signage a lot of the engagement design a lot of the extra engagement meetings is is more time so it's it's definitely a challenge to be able to sort of manage those expectations um and then just be really super efficient and um, you know, that it is on the owner a bit to be able to get the right people in the room. And, um, you know, wait till you have the right people in the room uh, to have the conversations. Otherwise, you'll be having them multiple times. So there's there's definitely a, a, a challenge to the process that has to do with the potential extra time, you know, the design team needs to put in during during the process and particularly after the process. Are Excellent you, question. Um, can you guys talk about like challenges with doing a net zero high school where, you know, that's a type of facility that's occupied after hours and, you know, throughout the year, like, is that even possible? And, and what would the challenges be with that? It's a whole different ball game. And one of the things has to do with sort of the total square footage. So your mechanical system design changes once you get over that 150,000 or so square feet. Um, I think every, everyone, please chime in here. And in terms of, is it doable? I think there's a reason why no one is, has done it yet. And I think a lot of the, um, is it doable questions probably resolve around that exactly what you said sort of the the large size of the building and the operational and the operational schedules i think that every one of these conversations is 100% applicable to high school design and the challenge to reduce your initial energy usage all very uh, important to the to the process, so getting at that um, energy use goal and setting that goal early in the process, using all these strategies to try to achieve that energy use goal, definitely doable, useful, advantageous on a high school. When it gets to the PV array, that might be a different that might be a different ball game, and I hope we get to do that soon. I think so it's actually very, easier, right? Because, well, I mean, you get more roof on a high school. And no, not um, necessarily true. So can you hear me? Yeah. OK, because before I was muted. Um, Karen, we actually are under construction with the same owner from Wild Lake for a new high school. And of course, needless to say, net zero came up as a question. Um, we were able to put on enough PV to cover 13% of the energy use for that school, but that takes over over half of the roof. Um, and not to mention, you know, that's only 13%. So on a tight site that we have there, I mean, the ground mounted array would have to be quite large. So again, it's like it's money and space. <laughs> So with a very energy efficient high school, much like that elementary school, a lot of the design strategies we've talked about today have been incorporated, the acuity, you know, um, system, the demand controls, all of that is there, but, um, but to get, since it's a larger building, it's 278,000 square feet as opposed to 106,000. So the array would have to be much larger and you just have to have the space for it. So, you know, there's gonna be one if there isn't already, you know, if that's not one of the emerging ones, but you just have to have the space for that many PV and of course the money to fund them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was, I mean, I totally agree with you. I, I meant, I didn't start off my sentence well. It, it may be easier to get a PPA involved though for a high school versus like an elementary or middle. Oh, that's just a great the point. Floor size mm -hmm. because a lot of the PPAs that we try to work with for our clients aren't interested unless it's a big Costco or a big high school or 
a like a district wide amalgam of projects together that they can bundle because they're not interested in just dealing with a 50,000 square foot roof, but a 200,000 square foot roof maybe is more uh, interesting to them. And so maybe you could really work on trying to lease your roof if you can make it large enough and attractive enough as a high school. But I hear what you're saying, Robin, about it's still a challenge. Yeah, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. sites, so. Mm -hmm. I think we're gonna we're gonna call it there. We're we're at yeah. time, and thank you for for putting that together. And and that was that was great. This should be up on the video library for AIA Baltimore. If you look in look on YouTube, uh, <laughs> probably probably takes a week or a week and a half. And um, thank you everybody for for joining us. Thanks everyone for all your questions. Thank you.